can I ask a dark question? As opposed to the other things we've been talking about? <laughs> Well, there's there's always a thread, a hopeful message. I think there'll be a hopeful message on this one, too. You may have the wrong guess. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, if you were to bet money on the way that human civilization destroys itself, or it collapses in some way that un is where the result would be unrecognizable to us as anything akin to progress, what would you say? Is it nuclear weapons? Is it some societal breakdown through just more traditional kinds of war? Is it engineered pandemics, nanotechnology? Is it artificial intelligence? Is it something we can't even expect yet? Do you have a sense of how we humans will destroy ourselves? Or m might we live forever? I think what, what governs my view of this thing is is the ability for us to focus ourselves collectively right and that gives me the choice of looking at this and saying what are the odds we will do x versus y right um so go look at the 62 cuban missile crisis yes where uh we looked at the potential of nuclear war and we stared right in the face of that to me, I consider that to be, you want to talk about a hopeful moment? That's one of the rare times in our history where I think the odds were overwhelmingly that there would be a nuclear war. And uh, I'm not the super Kennedy worshiper that, you know, I grew up in an era where he was, uh, especially amongst uh, people in the Democratic Party, he was almost worshiped. And I was never that guy. But I will say something. John F. Kennedy, by himself, um, probably made decisions that saved a hundred million or more lives because everyone around him thought he should be taking the road that would have led to those deaths. And to push back against that is when you look at it now, I mean, again, if you were a betting person, you would have bet against that. And that's rare, right? Um, so, so when we talk about how the world will end, um, the fact that one person actually had that in their hands meant that it wasn't a collective decision. It gave, remember I said, I trust people on an individual level, but when we get together, we're more like a herd and we devolve down to the lowest common denominator. That was something where the higher uh, ethical ideas of a single human being could come into play and make the decisions that, that, that influence the events. But when we have to act collectively, I get a lot more pessimistic. So take what we're doing to the planet. And we talk about it always now in terms of climate change, which I think is far too narrow. Uh, look at, you know, and, and, and I, I always get very frustrated when we talk about these arguments about, is it happening? Is it human? Just look at the trash. Forget, forget yeah. climate for a second. We are destroying the planet because we're not taking care of it. And because what it would do to take care of it would require collective sacrifices that would require enough of us to say, okay. And, and we can't get enough of us to say, okay, because too many people have to be on board. It's not John F. Kennedy making one decision from one man. We have to have 85% of us or something around the world. Not just, you can't say, we're going to stop uh, uh, doing damage to the, to, the, to the world here in the United States if China does it, mm -hmm. right? So the amount of people that have to get on board that train is hard. You get pessimistic hoping for those kinds of shifts unless- it's right, you know, Krypton's about to explode. We have, and so I think if you're talking about a gambling man's view of this, that that's got to be the odds on favorite because it requires such a unanim. I mean, and the systems maybe aren't even in place, right? The, the mm -hmm. fact that we would need intergovernmental bodies that are completely discredited now on board, and you would have to subvert uh, the national interests of nation states. I mean, the, the amount of things that have to go right in a short period of time, we don't have 600 years to figure this out, right? So to me, that that looks like the most likely just because the things we would have to do to avoid it seem the most unlikely. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I I believe, call me naive, in just like you said with the individual, I believe that charismatic leaders, individual leaders will save us. Like this, What if you don't get them all at the same time? What if you get a charismatic leader in one country, but under, or what if you get a charismatic leader in a country that doesn't really matter that much? Well, it's a ripple effect. So it starts with one leader and their charisma inspires other leaders. Like, so it's a, uh, it's like one ant queen steps up and then the rest of the ants starts behaving. 
And then there's like little other spikes of leaders that emerge. And then that's where collaboration emerges. I tend to believe that like when you heat up the system and shit starts getting really chaotic, then the leader, whatever this collective intelligence that we've developed, the leader will emerge. Like, there, Don't you think there's just as much of a chance, though, that the leader would emerge and say, the Jews are the people who did all this? That's right. gonna, you know what I'm saying? is That the idea that they would come up, you have a charismatic leader and he's going to come up with the right, or she is going to come up with the right solution as opposed to totally coming up with the wrong solution. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is you could be right, but yeah. a lot of things have to go the right way. But my intuition about the evolutionary process that led to the creation of human intelligence and consciousness on Earth results in the the power of like if we think of it just the love in the system versus the hate in the system that the love is greater the human the 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 the, the human kindness potential in the system is greater than the human uh hatred potential and so the leader that is in the time when it's needed the leader that inspires love and kindness will is more likely to emerge and will have more power. So you have the Hitlers of the world that emerge, but they're actually in the grand scheme of history are not that impactful. So it's it's weird to say, but not that many people died in World War II. If you look at the 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 the, the full range of human history, uh, you know, it's uh, you up to 100 million, wh whatever that is, with natural pandemics too, you can have those kinds of numbers, but it's still a percentage. I forget what the percentage is, maybe three, 5% of the human population on earth. Maybe it's a little bit focused on a different region, but it's not destructive to the entirety of human civilization. So the I believe that the the charismatic leaders when time is needed that do good for the world in uh, the broader sense of good are more likely to emerge than the ones that say kill all the Jews. I, it's, it's it's possible though, and this is just, you know, I've thought about this all of 30 seconds, but I mean, uh, it, 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 it's- We're betting money here on the, on the 21st century. Who's gonna I, win? I, I think maybe uh, you've divided this into too much of a black and white dichotomy, yes. this love and good on one side and this evil on another. Let me throw something that might be more in the center of that linear uh, a balancing act, self-interest, which may or may not be good. You know, good the good version of it we call enlightened self-interest, right? The bad version of it we call selfishness. But self-interest to me seems like something more likely to impact the outcome than either love on one side or evil on the other. Simply a question of what's good for me or what's good for my country or what's good for my point of view or what's good for my business. I mean, if you tell me, um, and, I, and maybe I, I'm, a, I'm a coal miner or maybe I own a coal mine. If you say to me, we have to stop using coal because it's hurting the earth, I have a hard time disentangling that greater good question from my right now good feeding my family question, right? So I think I think maybe it's gonna be a much more banal thing than good and evil, much more a question of we're not all going to decide at the same time that the interests that we have are, are aligned. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But I mean, I've looked at Ayn Rand and objectivism and kind of really thought like, how bad or good can things go when everybody's acting selfishly? But I think we're just talking two ants here with microphones talking about two ants here with microphones. <laughs> <self. right. laughs> but like <laughs> the the question is when they when this spreads. So what what is what do I mean by love and kindness? I think it's human flourishing on Earth and throughout the cosmos. It feels like whatever the engine that drives human beings is more likely to result in human flourishing. And people like Hitler are not good for human flourishing. So that's what I mean by good, is they, is, is there's a, I mean, maybe it's an intuition that kindness is an evolutionary advantage. <laughs> I, I hate those terms. I hate to reduce stuff to uh, the, the evolutionary biology always, but it just seems like for us to multiply throughout the universe, it's good to be kind to each other. And those leaders will always emerge to save us 
from the Hitlers of the world that want to kind of burn the thing down with a flamethrower. That's the intuition. But let's talk about, you You brought up evolution several times. So let, let, me, let me play with that for a minute. Um, I think going back to animal times, we are conditioned to deal with overwhelming threats right in front of us. So I have quite a bit of faith in humanity when it comes to impending doom right outside our door. Uh, if Krypton's about to explode, I think humanity can rouse themselves to great if, and would give power to the people who needed it and be willing to make the sacrifices. But that's what makes, I think, the the pollution slash climate change slash you know screwing up your environment um, uh, threat so particularly insidious. Is it happens slowly, right? It defies fight and flight mechanisms. It defies yeah. the natural ability we have to deal with the threat that's right on top of us. And it requires an amount of foresight that while some people would, would be fine with that, most people are too worried and understandably, I think, too worried about today's threat rather than next generation's threat or whatever it might be. So, I mean, when we talk about when you had said, what, what do you think the greatest threat is? I think with nuclear weapons, I think could we have a nuclear war? We darn right could. But I, I think that there's enough of, of a inertia we're against that because people understand instinctively, if I decide to launch this attack against China and I'm India, we're going to have 50 million dead people tomorrow. Whereas if you say, we're going to have a whole planet of dead people in three generations if we don't start now, I think the evolutionary uh, uh, way that we have, have, have evolved mitigates maybe against that. In other words, I think I would be pleasantly surprised if we could pull that off. Does that make sense? <laughs> totally. I don't mean to be like, the, I'm the, I'm the no, side predicting great. doom. <laughs> this, well, it's, it's fun that way. I think we're both, uh, maybe I'm over the top on the love oh, thing. Maybe I'm over the top on the doom. So, <laughs> so it's, it, it, makes, it makes for a fun chat, I think. 